Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mindful Leader Practices podcast. I'm your host, Anu Arora, and today I'm here with Sarah Cruz. Sarah Cruz is an Ayurvedic practitioner for the last 24 years. She has been practicing here, uh, was practicing here in Seattle, and has now moved a little bit further away from me in Oregon. Sarah, Sarah and I know each other for the last eight years. Um, she has been my practitioner as well, and I have benefited a great deal from Ayurveda. Many of you know that I also went through a one-year Ayurveda counselor program, and so very much believe in this modality of holistic well-being. Sarah has a niche for life transitions, and I bet we are in some life transition or the other at all times, but then there are some major life transitions, and she helps us get through them. Uh, I am really happy and pleased to welcome Sarah to our show today, and I'm going to pass it on to her uh, to see if there's anything else you'd like to add to her introduction. Hi, Anu. Thank you so much. It's really a joy to have this conversation with you and to share with your guest about Ayurveda. I also want to acknowledge my primary teacher of Ayurveda, Dr. Vasant Ladd, and I know he's also one of your esteemed teachers as well, Anu. So just the other day, I watched the documentary called The Doctor from India. It's available on Prime. I'd watched it a few times before, but I watched it again, and it just re-enlivened within me, you know, why I do what I do. Um, just the beauty of Ayurveda and how it can touch people's lives so deeply. And yeah, just very grateful for Dr. Ladd for bringing Ayurveda to the West, to the world in such a broad way. Thank you, Sarah. And with that, I think uh, the first question is, what is Ayurveda and what does it mean by that I, you are an Ayurvedic practitioner? So what do you do? That. Yes. So Ayurveda is technically the healing modality, the medical tradition from India. It's said to be more than 5,000 years old. And the words themselves, Ay Ayur or Ayus and Veda means the science of life, the science of all of life, all of who we are. And Ayurveda is also the sister science of yoga. So Ayurveda and yoga developed side by side, and traditionally they were meant to be practiced together. So as we've seen yoga take up popularity around the world, people are learning more about Ayurveda as well, wondering how they can heal themselves. And so this is what I do with my clients. They come to me for an Ayurvedic consultation or maybe a longer program. And my goal is to help each person return to themselves to really become empowered and have tools to heal themselves. And Ayurveda teaches us that we are all unique individuals. So there's no one remedy for every disorder. And each person needs to maybe eat slightly different for their unique Ayurvedic constitution or doshas, or the remedy that they need could be different. Say one person is vata and they're having a cough. Another person is pitta. They're also having a cough. The herbs might be different based on their constitution, or I might give them different dietary suggestions. So when I meet with someone, uh, we really look at the whole person, their health history, their current state, their goals. And I, I offer suggestions around um, nu nutrition. Absolutely. So food, herbs and primarily lifestyle. It's what we do every day and the way we take care of ourselves determines how we feel and how we feel is important because that allows us to move toward fulfilling our dharma or our purpose in life ultimately. No, yeah, that's beautiful. And there are quite a few few things um that you know you said so eloquently and beautifully because I've heard Ayurveda described many times. I describe it myself too to people. Uh, but this is the way you said I um, Ayurveda is about returning people to themselves. It's almost like bringing them back home. And we are living uh, almost like we are living away from ourselves. 
right yeah, so that that was just just beautiful on you know how how do we even become aware of who we are and then get centered into living in 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 that body in in <laughs> even utilizing the mind fully but really truly living in that body which we have been given and honoring that body which we have been given because not all bodies are created equal not all minds are created equal not every whole being is a unique being and so thank you so much for describing that you also mentioned vata and pitta and i know these are this is a science in itself but if we want to give because we have these terms in in this podcast people will be wondering what it is and i'll put links also to to some of the you know introduction to ayurveda but if you in nutshell can describe what are different you know body constitutions and what does vata pitta mean yes and so we each have a combination of doshas within us and they're coming from the five elements so ether air fire water and earth so these five elements appear in nature and they're also within our bodies and in the ayurvedic paradigm we break them down into three categories or doshas which are these fundamental energies that we all possess internally but in different proportions so the first one is vata and vata is made up of ether and air and is the energy of movement and communication vata people tend to be very creative they might move faster leaner body type um, they are prone sometimes to anxiety or overwhelm and so for vata individuals we like to keep them warm keep them grounded and make sure there's plenty of oil in their lives <laughs> And then the second dosha is pitta and pitta is the energy of transformation and digestion within the body that we all have. And pitta is made up of fire and water elements and um, pitta individuals tend to be very driven and passionate, sometimes intense. And they're the natural leaders, the ones who are the CEOs of companies, the ones who will get the job done. And when out of balance, they can experience sometimes conflict or anger. Um, when in balance, they can be very um, effective and grounded, um, get the job done, like I said. So they're very reliable, a, re a reliable business partner, reliable partner or friend in life is Pitta. And then Kapha um, is different, quite different than Vata and Pitta. Kapha is the energy of structure and lubrication and Kapha is made up of water and earth elements. So Kapha is more stable. There's stability. There's a slow quality. A Kapha person might move more slowly through life. They're not bothered. They're not in a hurry. They can be very compassionate. Sometimes they can be lazy and when out of balance, they can be prone to congestion or mucus um, or depression. So for kaphas, we want to keep them moving, keep them active. Um, I guess I didn't share what pitta can do. Pitta can always go to nature, cool down pitta's fires, go be in nature, be by cool bodies of water, trees. This is a very quick way to balance pitta. So there's a lot to say about the doshas. And again, we all have all three within us, but in different proportions. We might be dominant in one or two or there might be one that continues to go out of balance. And so, yeah, that's a whole other topic to dive into. I think once we have a little more understanding of our doshas, then we can start to make choices around which foods are best for us, which practices, which environments. And yeah, it's very, it's a very rich system that way. Yeah. And it'll be lovely for us to get back together and get into the depth of this because it's very juicy and and the more we learn the more um, more we can manage ourselves more we um, can recognize when we are going out of balance and have ways to bring ourselves back into balance so so there's just so much more control on how we can live life once we have a deeper understanding of the system um, so on for another day but now I just uh, another question here is that now that we have this very basic very high level introduction of Ayurveda here how do people get 
started in terms of practices? If I want to start practicing, can I practice it without coming to you on my own in my daily life? And how? Yes. And so there are even dosha quizzes you can take online that will give you a sense about your constitution. That can be fun. Um, Banyan Botanicals has a nice one. Um, but in terms of daily self-care that I recommend to a lot of my clients, one thing I share with everyone is just this idea that we are so connected to nature. We are a reflection of nature and nature's rhythms have an impact on us as well. So I do recommend for all my clients to eat at, on a pretty regular schedule. So eat foods at a regular time and not to skip a meal, especially lunch, especially if you're pizza, you don't want to miss lunch. So eating um, regularly and keeping, maintaining a regular bedtime. So if you know your body needs seven or eight hours of sleep, really starting to wind down 30 or 60 minutes before your optimal chosen bedtime and have that be pretty consistent throughout the week. And, you know, it can vary within the hour. If you aim to go to bed by 10, sometimes it's 930 or 1030, that's fine. But within the hour, if you can maintain that your life will change. And, you know, truly we don't, we don't want to be too rigid either. So we don't want to feel bad, like, oh, I didn't get to bed by 10. I was up till midnight. I'm not following my commitment. We don't want to feel bad. And so it's the idea that it's what we do most often that counts. If you're maintaining your optimal bedtime five or six nights a week, great. If you're out with friends late on the weekend and you're up till 1 a.m. sometimes, okay, we have to enjoy the life. So, but the idea is what we do most often is going to benefit. So regular meal times, regular bedtime. Another thing I suggest is upon rising in the morning to drink a tall glass of warm water or water with lemon. Mm. So lemon water, and I even add a little pinch of salt and a little honey. So it's very rehydrating for the body. It's a natural source of electrolytes and it flushes out toxins from the nighttime. People who drink this lemon water in the morning may not even need a cup of coffee to get the bowels moving because just the water itself is oftentimes enough. So if you haven't tried this, I would recommend trying it for a week and see how you feel. And then the next one I recommend to almost all of my clients too is pranayama, breath practice. So bringing awareness to the breath, and this is a huge part of mindfulness. I imagine you've brought it up many times in your podcast, how the breath and mindfulness are so connected. Um, so this is something that I recommend, and there are many types of pranayama, <clears throat> but initially thinking about having the exhalation be a little longer than the inhale. So mm -hmm. when we inhale and we are holding our breath unconsciously, it builds pressure and anxiety and stress internally. But if we can breathe in and let our exhale be a little longer, then it calms the nervous system. So simply that awareness of the breath. And then if you want to go a little deeper, one of my favorites is called Nadi Shodhana mm -hmm. or the alternate nostril pranayama. And there are a lot of good references for that practice, but basically it balances the right and left hemispheres of the brain and um, brings about a parasympathetic nervous system response to the body. My fa my favorite way of reducing anxiety, the, the fastest is I Nadi Shodhana. That. I love that <laughs> one. Maybe, you know, what we can do towards the end of the episode, we can, you know, if you, if you can guide us and then we'll do it together. And maybe yes. then our uh, listeners will also join us in that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I have one more and there's so many Ayurvedic tips that are yeah. beneficial, but one more that I recommend for most of my clients, especially if Vata and Pitta doshas are elevated, mm -hmm. then this one is fantastic. Um, I recommended it for women, for children, for men. Um, it's called Abhyanga. It's self massage, giving yourself an oil massage. And if you've never given yourself an oil massage, just for fun, go ahead and try it out sometime. Mm. If you know that you are, you know, running warm or hot, then a cooling oil like coconut or sunflower are nice. Or if you tend to run 
uh, cold, then, or I'm sorry, yeah, tend to run cold, then you want to use a warming oil such as sesame seed, not toasted, just <laughs> regular sesame seed oil or almond oil can be warming and nourishing for the body. And I think you do this practice as well, right, Anu? I love it. <laughs> that these are all the practices. I love them, you know, starting with, uh, you know, and and then the rhythm, the being in the rhythm of nature. I think that's huge. I have seen that, uh, you know, when you're not sleeping well at night or even, you know, you're getting later to bed, then you have harder time waking up the next morning and then everything from there on becomes downhill so rhythms have have a great impact on my life and there was a time when I went through insomnia a little bit and I would sit in my window and watch the bird feeder at night and I never saw a bird come to the bird feeder never saw so it's like birds can do it right <laughs> <laughs> other beings of nature do it very well what's us with humans yes we we can't follow the rhythms of nature that well as the rest of the beings can so so i i, I have seen the benefit of that but just wanted to bring that observation I love that, Anu. Well, that's one of the primary causes of imbalance or disease, according to Ayurveda, is when we override the body's signals or the body's wis wisdom. Maybe we're tired at 930, but we stay up until midnight. We're overriding, overriding. Or if we're feeling hungry by 11. 30 midday, but we don't get to lunch until two, then we're overriding the hunger signal, ignoring it. We're ignoring our signals and we're getting out of that sync with nature. And that's when the body starts to really speak louder. Sometimes it shows up as pain or as inflammation. These things can come up. It's the body telling us, hello, listen. <laughs> so that just... goes back to mindfulness, right? You know, becoming that self-aware, becoming very present, going back to back home, back to yourself uh, and that connection with, you know, being in that moment to recognize that here's a signal. I and I here's another louder signal and here's another one. Just being present and listening to them and not overriding them. Yes. And, you know, our teacher, Dr. Ladd, he has a beautiful term for mindfulness. He calls it moment to moment, choiceless, passive awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this moment to moment awareness and it's up to us, you know, to decide if we bring in something that nourishes us or depletes us. And it's a moment to moment expression in life. And that's ultimately, I think the beauty of meditation is it takes us into that space of that mindfulness moment to moment. Mm -hmm. I know you have corporate clients that come to you and what do you see is the biggest challenges for our leaders out there in the world and whether they are in managerial positions, everybody's a leader and the ones who are individual contributors, what, what are they facing in terms of um, health challenges, which are very unique to the corporate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I see uh, mostly what I see with my corporate clients is kind of putting self-care at the very bottom of the list. There might mm -hmm. be a list of to-dos to check off deadlines, things to turn into the boss, these kind of things that have to get done that week. And maybe one's own self-care is really not being attended to you know, so kind of pushing like overdrive, it's like an over driving, overachieving kind of energy. And um, it tends to kind of throw off the internal rhythm of the body can throw off the hormones, and can throw off digestion and sleep. So those are things I see a lot is people coming to me with hormone imbalance, digestive disruption and sleep pattern um, problems with their sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. So these are common and they're all connected. They're all connected. And so what we talk about is, okay, yes, you have these responsibilities. Absolutely. And how can we bring your self care into your day? You know, I, but I don't have time to do these things you're telling me they might say. So we literally look at scheduling in on their, on the schedule, you know, five mm -hmm. minutes, stop everything 
and do some breathing practice, or you have to take your 10 minute break in the afternoon and walk around the building two times and mm. get some fresh air to clear the mind and to just calm the nervous system or, you know, to have priorities around your eating, maybe talk to your boss and say, you know, I really must take my 30 minute lunch break away from the computer, just in a quiet space where I'm sitting and eating, but I need to take that break. So sometimes it means advocating and taking your breaks. <laughs> wow. yeah. And, and, um, you know, do you, do you have success with that? Because people can, you know, get driven and really, um, you know, hung up on, no, I need to get this done and then I'll have time. And then, you know, when this project is over, that's when I can go to self-care. It's always the last thing. Um, but when you have this, uh, you know, um, bringing small, very small changes in and building them into sch schedule, you, do you think you have more success with that or? I think so, but also some accountability. So checking in regularly, seeing how it's going. Sometimes I honestly have to have that straight talk kind of conversation. Like if you want to feel better and avoid burnout, you mm. know, sometimes you really do have to stop or you need to take that weekend getaway or that week vacation, stop everything so you can come back fresh. And I'll give people examples of clients I have now who are in a post burnout type of phase where they're in, they've had to take six or 12 months off of work sabbatical and stop everything because their body was speaking so loudly that they had to stop. And I feel like this can be avoided. And in our twenties and thirties, you know, we are seemingly superhuman. We can do so many things, but ultimately how sustainable is that to go, 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 go drive forward and then we get into 40s and 50s, the body starts letting us know, whoa, please slow down, just slow down a little bit. And when we listen, usually things go pretty well. We can adjust. We're adaptable, resilient beings, ultimately. But when, when we keep overriding and going at that pace in our 40s and 50s that we were maybe going at age 25, uh, I've seen people march toward burnout. And that's what I want to help people avoid is that. <laughs> One thing um, about you is your own presence, which is just uh, so calming and you're radiating joy and health and well-being yourself. Um, is there your some secret practice that <laughs> you have within your bag or it's just like you're, you're living and breathing Ayurveda? That's <laughs> what is doing it. Oh, I think I have to give credit to Dr. Ladd and to my parents primarily for the living examples that they set. It's like you look at people living the kind of life you want, just do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I would say maybe it's part of my kapha constitution as well. But, you know, my mom has this saying that it's like a mantra. It's this like wise mantra. She doesn't even know it's a mantra. Mm -hmm. But when she said it, I'm like, that is very wise, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and when something is coming up, maybe it's uncomfortable or unpleasant or a surprise. She says, it is what it is. It is what it is. And basically like that acceptance of what's coming up moment to moment without being bothered, without being um, too shaken off of one center. So that has become um, this, the foundation of my practice, I would say, is life is so frenetic. Things are coming in all the time. Life is so full. But how bothered am I really going to get, you know? <laughs> and so it's, you know, having this um, care, but also having a level of detachment too, keeping that balance. So that's my practice. And then getting out in nature and walking outside, walking on the beach, walking in the forest um, and getting the sunlight on my skin. So those are a couple of things I, I notice every day that I practice. That's so lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we go into the alternate nostril breathing and, and oh. that? Yes, I think um, I really love the topic you have for your podcast, Anu, about mindfulness, because that's where we can find the answer to anything we're looking for. 
I think is in the quiet space within mindfulness. If we keep returning to a mindful awareness, then there's a deep peace that takes over and there's an understanding and any small or large answer we're seeking can come when we get quiet, when we get mindful. So there's that. And then I want to share a gem that I received from a friend recently. I was asking her for some of her best advice that she shares with her clients. <laughs> so I'll share it with you all because it's so fantastic. And so she said, simply just do that, which brings you your highest joy. You don't have to hold back, just move toward that, which brings your highest joy and that, and know that you deserve that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, the beauty of Ayurveda is it helps us to come back to ourselves, come back to our optimal state of health. So then we feel well enough to then move toward our joy or our passion in life. That's beautiful. Thank you. I'll keep doing that and coming back to that brings you joy. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. So should we do a, a, a couple of minutes of uh, alternate nostril breathing? Yes. And since most people are listening, I will give the audio cues as well as the vi uh, video cues. And so the way we practice this, you may want to blow your nose, make sure your nostrils are clear first. And then sit comfortably. You can be sitting cross-legged. You can be sitting with your legs, um, with your feet on the floor in a chair, just sitting comfortably. I preferably not with your legs crossed. Okay. And then your left hand can be resting in your lap. And go ahead and bring your right hand up. For the sake of ease in this practice, I'm going to have us bring our three middle fingers into our palms. So the pinky and the thumb are extended like the Hawaiian shaka symbol, right? Okay. Now we'll take the right thumb to close the right nostril and we'll inhale through the left nostril. Closing left with the pinky, exhaling through the right. Pause, inhale right, close right with your thumb, exhale left, pause, inhale left, close left with your pinky, exhale right, inhale right, close. Exhale, left. Inhale, left. Pause. Exhale, right. Inhale, right. Again, we'll pause. Exhale, left. Inhale, left, close and pause, exhale, right, slowing it down nice and slow, inhale, right, close and pause, exhale, left, one more round, inhale, left, Close and pause, exhale, right, pause, inhale, right, and now exhale completely out your left nostril, and you can rest your hand back down in your lap, keeping your eyes closed. And returning to your natural breath, breath, notice how your breath is feeling. Noticing your mind. Noticing how your body feels. Just noticing what's there. Just observing pure mindfulness, stillness. 
And now go ahead and take your two hands, rub them together, create some heat and place your warm palms over your eyes. And then resting your hands back down in your lap. So this is Nadi Shodana, the alternate nostril breath that brings balance to the right and left side of your brain. Great fo uh, focus if you're going to present to your team or you're going to present or perform on stage. This practice calms the nervous system right down. No room for anxiety once you've done this practice. And it can be a nice refresher um, in the morning, mid-afternoon, or even right before bed it can be helpful to prepare one for sleep. Love it. It's just immediately you can feel the breath slow down. There's just, you know, sense of calm. And, you know, and and of course, that's so great in in corporate environment where stress is very common, especially in a high pressure situation. Uh, just a few rounds of this would be helpful. You'd recommend about five five rounds or? Yeah, so about five minutes is a full practice. So back and forth is one round and about 12 rounds is a full practice. But like you said, even five rounds is enough to give a benefit. So if you're at work, you might even step into the break room or the restroom and kind of privately do a few rounds and then come back out and meet your team and you'll be feeling so calm and clear and confident. They might say, who is this? <laughs> person went in another another person came out <laughs> yeah. we have some magical practices here isn't it so thank you so much for sharing this thank you so much for being on the show today i have enjoyed every single minute of it and i am certain it will be the most valuable for our listeners out there so thank you thank you thank you thank you for all that you do anu thank you